he had to talk about uh, Australian Creek infrastructure uh, threat landscape and bill, which is, you know, it's a world apart from you guys in America uh, and Australian perspective, but just wanted to share what we see in Australia from a threat point of view and then what the government has done to, you know, build some kind of a framework or a legislation to protect both the governments and industries in this in the critical infrastructure space. So <clears throat> the next slide. So again, my last minute, so my colleague was going to join me to do the talk. So Mel Griffins, uh, he is unfortunately not well and sick. So I have to do all the talk myself. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be me solo doing it where before we were going to do Crow co-present. So, you know, it was just last minute. He's not well and sick. So we we all take over for that. So again, I'll not go through myself again. Tim introduced myself. Just we'll kick on to the presentation as uh, as we start. So okay, so here we are. So today, as I said, we're going to talk about the critical infrastructure threats that are increasing in in our Australian landscape point of view. Uh, so much like the rest of the world, Australia is witnessing a dramatic uh, increase in cyber threat uh, incidents targeting critical infrastructure, and that's happened last probably four to five years uh, where uh, the government themselves have seen uh, targeted threats coming from you know, threat actors or from various uh, countries in the world that are targeting Australian um, either political entities or critical infrastructure as perspective. Um, just, you know, Australia has got a Australian Cyber Security Center, which is the equivalent to the CISA or, or NS uh, from a CISA perspective. Um, they released a report, they do a report on cyber incidents reported yearly. Uh, so, you know, for for the year 2020, 20, 2020 and 2021 report, uh, they reported one quarter of all the cyber incidents that are reported to the government from an incident response point of view were, you know, targeted to critical infrastructure organizations or essential services, right? So that has raised awareness within the Australian government and the industry that, okay, we need to do something about this thing. Uh, so, you know, we've seen a precedented rise in threats in how the new norm of ICS security. So, you know, recently there have been growing cyber malware threats around critical infrastructure. Oops, sorry, going too far. Okay, all right, there you go. So again, I don't want to talk more about this slide. You know, most of you guys in the in the industry know that you know we've got a lot of challenges in this space in critical infrastructure, you know, including legacy technologies, increasing connectivity, uh, especially in in Australia. I'm not sure about American uh, landscape over there in technology, but in Australia, there is a lot of within critical infrastructure operators, owners, or, or organizations. There's a lot of adaption of uh, modernization technology that's increasing connectivity and uh, especially with cloud coming in the game. Uh, and that's because <clears throat> it's it's more better, it's it's because it's more cost effective and that's driving the decisions uh, from an operation point of view. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of attack, profil prof profilation attack kits where, for example, Pipe Dream that came out earlier this year, you know, we all saw how it can have like a Swiss army type of uh, modules that it can use to create different level of attacks uh, in, in the in the network in the network environment in ICS. You know, we've seen significant increase of ICS vulnerabilities. Now, when we talk about vulnerabilities, um, not saying that they weren't there before, they were there before, it's just that because critical infrastructure and asset owners has become really important now. So researchers from a security researchers who are doing responsible disclosure to threat actors who are trying to look for vulnerabilities, critical vulnerabilities in these ICS devices have increased, right? That's because they want to target that environment. So there's a lot of uh, increase in vulnerabilities that we're seeing. And again, ge geopolitical instability between uh, countries and zones. So, you know, recently, I don't know if you've seen, but where, you know, from a Chinese perspective, it's trying to take uh, graphs of the Asian Pacific region where it's trying to expand its, uh, uh, influence within the uh, Asia Pacific region and Australia is one of the key partners and traders in that space so uh, and that's the key one that you know we are Australia is looking ahead forward to is like how can China doesn't take much advantage in this space so okay so critical infrastructure bill right so with all this happening uh, 
back in 2015, 2015, 2016, the Australian government uh, brought up a, a bill, which is called infrastructure bill that was initially drafted to, okay, how can we uplift this critical infrastructure to more secure the organizations and industry and, and uh, assistance services within Australia. So initially there were four sectors, which included uh, mainly uh, water, ports, uh, energy, and oil and gas, right? And now they have increased that into 11 sectors. You can see they have brought in communication, financial services, data storage, processing, defense, uh, education and research, you know, food and grocery, healthcare, space technology, uh, communication. So that's added sectors in critical infrastructure. So all these sectors are regarded critical infrastructure as per Australian uh, uh, perspective from a bill point of view. Uh, and uh, with this bill coming in, they have increased reporting obligations to critical asset owners and also introduced uh, government powers and assistance in terms of if there is a incident, government has got you know a program to assist the asset owner, but also they have got, do have power to intervene and take over uh, the asset if it thinks uh, it will, you know, the compromise will affect their citizens and the, and the national interest. So then what we thought within, uh, okay, how does this compare to the, the American National Security Memorandum that was you know, signed by Biden, uh, President Biden and Biden administration back you know, last year. So what we were looking at from an Australian perspective, how does it compare to the American perspective, right? So, um, and if you see over here, we compare is that the memorandum that was signed by the President Biden was improving cybersecurity for critical infrastructure and control systems. Uh, more with, with some parallel, broad parallels in the aim, but significant differences in the approach taken, both from an Australian perspective and American perspective. So both the Australian and American approaches attempt to provide government with greater visibility over the critical infrastructure threat landscape. Uh, but mandating the reporting for cyber incidents. So that's commonality between those two that you have to report cyber incidents. Uh, but both programs also seek to uplift critical infrastructure network security by establishing best line security and the risk standards. But however, the approach taken to achieve these common aims differ significantly. And we'll talk about that later in the slides on how where Australian perspective sits and the American perspective sits with a with bill. So National Security Memorandum on Improving Cybersecurity for Infrastructure from America. So one of the measures America, uh, Australia approach has been to consult with, its, with uh, each industry sectors to establish a critical infrastructure risk management program. Uh, the in intervention was to provide sector specific rules and guidelines on what we would, what we would be considered a reasonable and proportionate response to meeting mandated obligations, right? So there were mandated obligations that as owners needs to do towards the government and that needed to be reasonably considered. However, in the, in the Biden, President Biden administration approach, uh, there has been more focus on specific medications as you can see on the screen. So, you know, where Australia did not, where the amendment in the bill that the, the Australia released, actually they just released uh, earlier this year in April, uh, version two that was was introduced and accepted in parliament was more a broader approach where you know in american perspective it was more focused on uh putting measures uh, and mitigations where uh, asset owners can act on something so while memorandum does direct development of cybersecurity performance goals for critical infrastructure through you know the CISA and NIST perspective it also seeks to establish the stronger security posture through specific strategies. This includes, you know, uh, initiative, uh, present initiative, uh, voluntary collaboration, effort to deploy a technology and system, systems for threat visibility indicators, detection and warning. So, you know, where President Biden did uh, bring in where you need to have, a, you know, a detection product or technology in your environment to give you visibility, to, you know, detect threats, detect indicator of compromises and so on, right? There was, uh, there was another initiative is mandating two-factor authentication uh, and encryption and log uh, retention requirements. So again, these are mitigations that were driven directly uh, from the 
uh, memorandum to the go asset owners creating standardized playbooks again you know creating non-threat playbooks creating use case playbooks for every asset owners um, you know mandating baseline security uh, standards for development of software sold to the government uh, and encouraging creek infrastructure uh, operators to establish a, a zero trust models to move to a secure cloud services where possible right so you know thus this are the directives from the uh, American National Security Memorandum from the uh, President Biden administration that were given. Uh, unlike in the US, most of the Australian critical infrastructure measures carry a significant penalties for non-compliance, right? Which I'll talk about, uh, which I'll talk about it in the coming slides that there are penalties that the Australian government has brought in if you do not comply. Uh, the voluntary collaboration approach taken in the US National Security Memorandum means the you know the NSM isn't regulated or a regulation or law, and there is no fines or non-compliance. Where in the US government experts uh, experts that expects that all responsible critical asset owners and operators will apply the measures as a whole of national effort while doing uh, while industry does its part. So it was more like a um, a community or industry community approach from the government. You need to go do this as a whole industry to uplift our uh, security program and, and security high uh, security program and that space. So moving into the Australian perspective. So again, broadening the critical infrastructure spectrum in Australia, as I mentioned earlier, we had four sectors when we started, which was you know uh, energy, water, transport, and gas, and moving to eleven sectors, which we identified earlier. Now, when we looked at the the US uh, critical infrastructure sectors, uh, it had 16 sectors that included a lot of other sectors in that space. Now, not sure of an uh, American perspective, but in Australia, when we had 11 sectors come in from four sectors where it created a lot of confusion between asset owners, where traditionally critical infrastructure or operation technology is known as you know mining, oil and gas, utilities, uh, anything that is process driven, so ports, transportation, that's critical infrastructure, bringing in like telecommunication, education and research, um, financial sectors, data processing, that create a bit of a questions and eyeballing, like okay, how can that be critical infrastructure? So that's gonna make things more complicated and more focused, right? But what the government came to know is that these are key sectors that the, the country and, the, and, the, and its citizens rely on. So that is critical to running the country, critical for their citizens to function day to day. That's why they had to bring in as a critical infrastructure because they are critical as a as an industry and as a community we serve, we, we do our day to day servicing. So taking all that into consideration, so significant asset and significant and systems of national in, in significant. So what does that really mean? Right? So the Australian approach subsid subdivides the critical infrastructure sectors into those defined as uh, defined critical assets right so all critical assets are you know information gathering directive that are government driven so uh that are deemed for they're deemed as a national significance which includes assets that are comprom com compromised could result in cascading consequences right critical assets are defined by reference to specific infrastructure that is core to the relevant sector for example a critical water asset is defined one of the more water sewer systems or networks that are managed by a single water utility and deliver services at least to 100,000 connections, so 100,000 homes. So that is then defined as a critical asset because you are servicing um, you know, significant of community users that can have an impact, national impact, if, if, if something happens to that utility and water gets compromised. So the, the tiered approach means most of the new obligations apply to owners and operators of these uh, critical infrastructure assets. So that's just an example from a water asset point of view, but that can apply to many other sectors. And, and um, there are within the amendment, there is within, within the bill, there is an amendment and there is also a second amendment bill that then clarifies and goes more narrower on who's uh, who is responsible from an asset point of view, from a regulation point of view and compliance point of view, which I'll talk about it earlier in the coming slides. 
So, okay, so government assistance uh, and enhanced obligations. So owners and operators for critical infrastructure assets are now subject to positive uh, security obligations, including implementation of risk management plan, which is standard mandatory reporting. Again, that, that that's part of part and partial of uh, the legislation. The changes also creates a new tier of assets called uh, national uh, systems of national significance and imposes um, uh, enhanced obligations on the folks responsible for those assets. So you can see over here, like uh, entities which are within the critical infrastructure sector, government assistance is uh, it's required, but positive security obligation and non-security uh, obligations is not really required. Now, uh, if you go to critical infrastructure assets, you know, there is government assistance required and then you have to give uh, obligations, security obligations. So you have to report. Uh, however, enhanced reporting is not required. And then if it's a uh, system of national significance, uh, with Australian perspective, all three are ticked off. So there is more power from a government perspective. So there are four core sectors announced in that space that are discussed. Uh, now, when I talk about the power, uh, it's, it's more only the Australian Security Signals Directorate that has got more power, which is the equivalent of, uh, I would say, NSA in the US market or, or, or CIA. Uh, or CIA together, where uh, the Austrian uh, Signal Director is the ASD, which is the intelligence organization under sitting under Department of Defense that has got the power. Within that, there are different agencies and departments, uh, you know, like Austrian Cyber Security Center, there's the Austrian Security, uh, Critical Infrastructure Security Agency, that then are different teams that are and organizations that are given directive on what's required. So government assistance measures, right? So the new government assistance measures, however, apply more broadly. Any critical infrastructure operator within one of the 11 sectors that we identified earlier may be subject to government assistance measure. Essentially, those measures allow the government to request information directly, an entity to take an action or intervene directly in an incident. Now, that is where that, that power takes over all of it, or takes pretty much a lot of action over there. So what that's trying to say is that all the 11 sectors that are there, that uh, within those sectors, the asset owners or the organizations that have got a critical asset that the government defines that's a critical asset. If there's an incident, the government has got a power to take direct action if the organization or they don't have capability of doing it and also intervene directly uh, and taking over the incident response or taking over the asset himself if they cannot uh, you know, restrict that compromise. So that's a what that's a lot of power given by the bill where asset owners don't have a say. The government can come in, take over, take the controls, take the operation, and 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 make sure it's safe and operational before they give back to the asset owner, hand it back to the asset owner. Uh, the information gathering direction is the first stage of uh, escalation in the event for a significant incident. The government may force the to disclose information related to the cyber incident to the or to decide whether there is need for further escalation in terms of uh, support and intervention. Right, the action direct direction allows the government to direct an entity to take action in a reasonable, necessary, and appropriate appropriate to achieving the oblig objective to resolving the incident. Right, so they have got they will give. Um, direction to reasonably guide the asset owner to resolve the incident. And intervention request, as I said earlier, um, you know, intervention is an extreme end to the government authority where it, it was at least popular among the reform, but um, it makes, you know, as, as I said earlier, intervention request allowed government directly to direct the uh, Australian Signals Direct, which is the ASD, within support of Australian Federal Police. Again, Australian Federal Police sits under the ASD to intervene directly in an incident, right? So they come in, they take over the incident, they take over the asset and, 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 and help the organization to restrict that incident itself. Um, one other thing that came out while we were discussing is that if the government comes and takes, the, takes over the inter, uh, and intervenes, it might take form of shutting down the asset or shutting down the operation or changing on or, or changing, analyzing, removing the controls, controlling infrastructure and its component parts. You know, if the government thinks the action is to shut down, remove, make changes, 
to reduce the impact of the incident, they have the power to do that without an astronaut owner have a say. So that is a higher con uh, uh, control and obligation that's given power from uh, legislation, which is again passed in in the both in the government and it's brought in in April as an implementation where now uh, asset owners and industries are running around to see how they can uh, uh, meet the obligation. Sorry, guys. Okay, perfect. So penalties, right? So we talked about uh, penalties earlier in the conversation. So, you know, the government, Australian government did bring penalties if we do not comply, uh, and uh, which is penalties are from a financial point of view. So in contrast to the US National Security Memorandum, uh, it's more voluntary collaboration approach, and the, but in the Australian approach has been established to legislation from a legislative obligation that carry fines for non-compliance, right? So the corporate penalties for failing to comply with, or, or with reporting or information provision obligation carry a penalty of $55,000 per breach, that's Australian dollars, um, or a day of non for for a day of non-compliance. So that's a daily breach. That's a daily fee of non-compliance. Failing to failing to comply with government assistance measure such as action direction or intervention orders can result in significant higher financial penalties in addition to a two years impri imprisonment. All right. So they've gone further down where if we do not comply uh, with the government direct the direct intervention, there is. Financial fine, which is you know one hundred thirty three thousand and one hundred sixty five thousand, but there's also two years imprisonment for the asset owner. So it can be the either now there is no clarity who who goes into the prison, whether there's a CEO or the board members, but that is there in 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 the in the legislation that makes it really serious from an asset owner as okay we you know driving them to we need to we will have to comply otherwise there's penalties and imprisonments. Uh, if we do not comply and the government thinks that that needs to be taken action on. So challenges for the government and industry with the, with the bill, right? So the rationale for the amendment to the Australian critical infrastructure laws were communicated by the government as urgent within with Australia facing a very serious and rapid deteriorating uh, cyber security environment. The government said they have compiling evidence that the the threat of cyber enabled attacks and manipulation of critical infrastructure assets is serious, considerable in scope and impact and increasing at a unprecedented rate, All right? So this was a direct quote from the girl, one of the ministers at that time. Much like the Biden memorandum, the obligation of the amendment was to ensure that critical infrastructure sectors achieve and maintain defined standard for security, but, the challenge for the government from an perspective, however, was to deliver both swift and comprehensive response to the threat. So, however, there was a significant disagreement during the consultation phase between the industry and the, and the government uh, on the exact response required. So the bill, the, there was a lot of back and forth discussions from the government and industry within Australia, uh, where it was uh, the industry was doing a lot of pushback to the government and there was a lot of consultation on time to say, okay, what is the right bill and amendment to tackle the problem that we're going to face, we're currently facing, we're going to face in future from a threat landscape to critical infrastructure or, or, or the emerging threats to national interests of Australia. Um, however, the development of the memorandum and the introduction to the parliament was preceded by the consultation process and that was based on a discussion paper. So the government then, what they did is they they invited industry participants as a discussion paper, uh, gave them the opportunity to write what they see is important from an Australian landscape point of view, uh, write a draft uh, that then, that discussion papers were submitted by industry. The government then took all of that and, and, and wrote an exposure draft of the bill. The intention of the consultation phase was to invite the industry in guiding the framework development because as I said earlier in the initial phase, there's a lot of the government initially brought in a bill that 
they worked as a, as a silo and not in the industry and the industry had a lot of pushback. So then they moved backwards and saying, okay, let's have a consultation with the industry and build a, and build a better framework uh, and, and, and a bill coming out of it. While the, while the government uh, continuously emphasized the agency of legislation uh, to safeguard critical infrastructure and in an increasing hostile threat landscape, those involved uh, in the consultation phase call the further consultation to clarify responsibilities, right? Leverage existing frameworks and reduce the regulatory burden, right? So again, the draft bill that came out still had got a lot of gray areas and the industry still did a pushback. Okay, there needs to be clarifications on responsibilities, on, on, on frameworks that the industry and the asset owners needs to oblige to you and, and reduce the duplication of frameworks that already asset owners are doing. So for example, within Australia, uh, many organizations that are, are aligned to the IEC 6443 or the NIST um, 800 or, or the Australian perspective, which is the AES, which is the Australian energy sector regulations that they have. Uh, this ob uh, obligation and amendment was on top of that. So they were trying to push, okay, can you um, uh, oblige this obligation as per the standards so we don't have to duplicate our work? So there was an industry push in that space. So one of the key drivers of, of this quorum of objections from the industry was the fact that cybersecurity maturity within the newly mined 11 sectors varied dramatically as did the existing level of regulation. Response exposure draft, many industries pointed out that they already had regulation regimes, standards, and they didn't manage uh, managed risk, risk for their assets. And this needed to be considered and, in, and incorporated to make amendment work eff eff efficiently and effectively as possible. So again, challenges for the government industry. So as I said earlier, we the government started with the initial quick draft bill. Uh, it was in interest of expanding the process. The government chose to design and define much of the regulation in a legislative instrument where they can legislate and have power rather than a more like an overarching guidance perspective. It created a lot of uncertainty for the industry, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and regulatory and financial impact, large largely because the definition were found to be unclear and something inappropriate, right? So there was a lot of gray area. Uh, industry complained about that, pushback, uh, you know, define what does an asset mean, you know, or a wrong asset while obligations were perceived as a wig. Uh, impact the stakeholders almost un, un, and compl complained that the consultation process was too rapid. The government had no sufficient, as had not sufficiently engaged them with uh, them regarding the concern and questions and recommendations. So, however, all that into consideration, the government still pushed their uh, the, the amendment in the bill that came out earlier this uh, year in April, which again, you know, I'm, I'm, I, was, I was currently in a uh, ASA conference in Canberra, and one of the presentations was about giving a brief uh, downtime or give give brief uh, timeline on the on the amendment by a lawyer and. You know, when he presented the bill, there was so much uh, gray area that owners needs to consult the government to define what are they obliged to and what is a critical asset for significance perspective. So that then brings into swift and comprehensive uh, action, but that's, is that achievable? Right, is which we from an industry point of view thought that's unachievable, right? So faced with so many issues, quickly became apparent the government had achieving both a swift and comprehensive response to the threat that was going to be possible, and many called for progress to be paused, right? So as a result, Parliament Joint Committee on Intelligence Security were tasked to review the operation, effectiveness, and implementation of proposed changes. The committee acknowledged that many companies, industry bodies, and stakeholders did not feel like the input of feedback had been action or acknowledged, right? So the committee did acknowledge that, that the industry input uh, and feedback was not uh, action or acknowledged, right? Due to the lack of the promotion of the process, inadequate engagement, again, nothing new from a government perspective and in, insufficient information to allow stakeholders to make comprehensive submissions. 
the committee also warned that if the government persisted in attempting to achieve both a swift and comprehensive response to the threat process, it may achieve it neither, right? So by pushing this legislation faster, it may not achieve anything because again, the asset owners, the industry is not ready and it will take a longer, a longer time to oblige to it, right? So, but with all that into consideration, the government still pushed the bill to the parliament, which got approved by majority. And the response from the government was that we wanted something out there and then we can revisit that and amend that as we can see uh, use cases and examples coming out of it, which again, that was a response from a government perspective. So, you know, just a rough uh, uh, history on the bill perspective, you know, there was a first bill that was urgently driven by the government, pushback from the industry, consultation from the industry. Second bill came in where, you know, gave a bit of more clarity on that space. Uh, that then had a bit of, sorry guys. That then brought, okay, the government then brought about uh, legislation and then actions on it. So then they brought uh, Slacky Act, which was December 2021, which expands the critical infrastructure. Government assistance obligation broke, was brought in. Cybersecurity incident no, uh, notification obligation was brought in. An obligation will only apply if they are switched on for a specific sector. And then uh, earlier this year in April, another act came out, which we call it, which we appreciate as SLAPI, uh, a lot of acronyms over there, where in that act, critical infrastructure risk management program and a positive security obligation. So all the asset owners which are part of that sectors and that defined um, uh, critical infrastructure from a government perspective as per the bill, uh, needs to have a good security risk management program in place and they should have secure, positive security obligation. And in and, and this bill, it enhanced the cyber security obligation for system of national significance. So this bill gave power to the government that they can intervene uh, in an incident where you as an asset owner are defined as a system of national significance to the, to the uh, Australian government. Okay, now risk obligation and challenges in that space. So just keeping touch in my time. So I'm just gonna quickly go through this space. So one of the key changes that many sectors are now facing is establishing a risk management program, right? It's not easy, we all know that, you know, they, these obligations have been designed and established to minimize safeguards, makes sense, but only where there is currently no other obligation setting that achieves the same purpose, right? So, for example, those entities subject to defense industries, security programs will not, with some exceptions, but some subject to risk management program obligations, they are already having existing and equivalent obligations in, in, in place. Owners and operators uh, of declared critical infrastructure assets with positive security obligations now need to ensure they have programs and processes and procedures approved by the government in place to order to comply with uh, uh, legis legislation, right? So, you know, asset owners have to now rush in to make sure they can oblige by having risk management programs and all other uh, program processes in place to oblige. So safeguards to government powers, okay? Before issuing any author authorization, government must be certified that one, cyber incident uh, that will impact a critical infrastructure asset has occurred, is occurring or is imminent, right? Uh, now we understand occurred and occurring, it's non. Imminent is something that one of, you know, a question was raised in the industry, like how would an asset owner know that there is a threat imminent? What government said is that from their intelligence and their partners, for example, the five eyes, the American, the British, the Canadian, and the New Zealand, or any other, you know, intelligence community that they get information that there's an imminent threat from a threat actor, that they see a target, Australia is a target, then they government would come and intervene saying, okay, you know, there is an imminent threat that we've been defined by our partners, before as explained, and we see you in that sector and that in that industry, we need to then make sure you are protected or we will need to intervene and make sure that you are not compromised part of that imminent threat. Uh, secondly, material risk that cybersecurity incident will seriously produce Australian social and economic stability, defense and national security. 
uh, hardly no, no other regular system to provide response to the incident. So if you're an asset owner and you've got 10 asset operators, operations, and out of that 10, only three are defined as a, a significant in, uh, interest or a critical asset, you just need to respond, uh, oblige on those three. You don't need to then give 10 asset as a like, regulatory. So that's clear. Um, However, um, the fourth one, uh, affected entity is unwillingly or unable to respond to, the, to that incident. So government comes in and helps out or intervenes if they don't have the ability or not willing to uh, respond to that incident. Oops. Sorry, guys. Perfect. Now, I've got a couple of slides. Oh, sorry. Uh, all right. You go for it, man. Right. We, are, we are hanging with you. All right. Thanks. All right. So... Working with the regulation governments to ensure cybersecurity uh, in this space. So quickly on that space, again, experience from uh, based on our experience, uh, listening to the recent experiences in the industry, we wanted to create a framework that practitioners can draw and best work with any changes uh, from uh, regulation government regards to their specific sectors. All right. So our conceptual method uh, called the octagon of agony captures that what we feel are the key areas that practitioners can focus to ensure compl full compliance within, with minimal potential disruption, right? So, okay, again, working with regulation and government, so scope, again, is the organization captured by the regulatory reform? Make sure that's captured. Impact, how will the changes affect the organization, the legislation, how will it affect the organization? Accountability is who's accountable in response, right? So as I said earlier, you there is imprisonment or there is fines, who is accountable in the organization for that action from an from organization perspective? Okay, visibility, right? As I said earlier, from an American perspective, you know, you need to uh, deploy systems that can give you visibility. So same over here on the uh, Australian, uh, Australian perspective is that Comprehensive view of critical asset is essential. So have systems that are deployed to give you visibility of your network, uh, optimize risk management and compliance functions, establish capabilities required to demonstrate compliance. Uh, so these are some actions that we would recommend asset owners to you know, work to help you in the legislation. Awareness, keep the organization aware of any changes and responsibility uh, while the government keeps updating their legislation. And practice participation is important. Engage with regulators in, in, in your own um, regulatory body and community and the government uh, where you can be more proactive and upfront on, on how things are going on, on your organization from a security perspective. And uh, yep, that wraps me up. Uh, thank you all.